and a good evening and welcome in to MedStar Health's Healing Wounds, Saving Limbs webcast. We are streaming live right now on Facebook and YouTube from MedStar Union Memorial Hospital right here in Baltimore. We have a jam-packed audience in our studio. <laughs> you can clap. Go ahead. Make it. That's, not a, that's not a clap track here. And also, I am your host, Jamie Costello from WMAR ABC 2 News. Yeah, okay. All right, we are here to discuss wounds that don't heal. We are here to discuss ulcers that become infected. Listen, th these are topics we don't want to talk about, but we are going to tonight because we're out to save your life right here. And for the next 60 minutes, you can be part of our audience. You can be part of the question and answer period with some of the best and brightest that we have to offer here at MedStar. So the floor is open. Any question, you just fire away. If you're a physician or a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner, you can earn one hour of CME credit. I just found what CME, it is continuing medical education. I can get a credit tonight, so all I have to do is watch. All you have to do is post your name and email in the comments section on YouTube or Facebook page, and you can get proper credit. Now, if you have a loved one with poor circulation due to diabetes, you have infection or peripheral artery disease, let them know that we're doing this on Facebook and YouTube right now. Uh, MedStar Health's Facebook page is open or MedStar Health on YouTube. Give them a call right now. Use your cell phone and say, hey, I think you should listen to this and watch it here tonight. Post your comments, your questions, click a like, and be sure to share the post so your friends can join in on the discussion. We want to hear from you tonight. We've got 60 minutes to go. Let us meet the team right now that we have assembled. Dr. Paul Carroll is a podiatric surgeon here at MedStar Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery, specializes in foot and ankle trauma and reconstructive surgery. We thank the doctor for being here, Dr. Carroll. Dr. Tiffany Ho, a podiatric surgeon who specializes in complex lower extremity wounds, and diabetic, uh, diabetic limb salvage. Dr. Ho, thank you. Zachary Martin, the doctor, right in the middle. Plastic sur It's always great to have a plastic surgeon in the audience here tonight. Uh, he's with the MedStar Plastic and Reconstruction Surgery and the medical director of the Hyperbaric Medicine and Wound Healing Center here at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital. Thank you, doctor, for coming. We have nurse practitioner Elena Blake Zakis. And she has a doctorate of nursing practice, and her specialty is in adult, and uh, she is, uh, has certificates in wound healing using hyperbaric medicine. We love her for being here tonight. Thank you. You're going to have the tough questions. You know they're coming. <laughs> and on the end, here he is, right here. You're right here. I can touch Dr. Kevin <laughs> Brown, <laughs> vascular sir. Oh, thank you, right? Don't go anywhere. Vascular surgeon with MedStar Heart and Vascular Institute who treats all forms of vascular disease. Here they are. Five wound care and limb preserving experts ready to share information on treating these issues and answer your questions. Again, go to Facebook Live, go to the YouTube, MedStar Health, type in your question and send it and give us a like. All right, right now, let's get endocrinologist Dr. Malik Sheikh up here to start us off. 1001, 1002, 1003. 1004, 1005, 1006, 1007, 1008, 9, 10. I think you get the point. 17 seconds, somebody comes up with diabetes in this country. 17 seconds. From the time it took you, from going from your chair up to here to get settled, diabetes. I want you to tell us about the impact on a wound to heal that wound. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Jamie. So I didn't know that I'm that uh, slow to come up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very unfortunate. So uh, oftentimes uh, uh, we, we deal with this on a daily basis. So in the United States now, we have more than 30 million people who have type 2 diabetes. So in the last couple of decades, it's very unfortunate that uh, we have more and more patients who are diagnosed with this nasty disease. And that's mostly driven by the obesity uh, epidemic that we, we have in this country. So um, we're doing much better job in, in controlling diabetes, but because of the increase in the number of patients who have type 2 diabetes, we still have plenty of people who have uh, problems with this disease. The, one of the most common complications of diabetes is usually that happens within the first five years of the disease if it's not very well controlled, usually is the diabetes uh, neuropathy. So what that is, it's... Uh, Nerve damage mostly happens, starts with the toes and starts to go up, mm. uh, where the patient 
unfortunately loses the protective sensation of their feet, and that can increase their risk of having uh, trauma that would lead to an ulcer, a wound, and because the patient may or may not know that they have this ulcer, and because of diabetes also can cause poor circulation to the feet, that wound does not heal. And I usually tell my patients that uh, bacteria, they love to be around sugar, and because people who have uncontrolled diabetes have high sugar by definition, bacteria uh, is invited to be in that ulcer, and that eventually may cause an infection within that ulcer. And when that happens, it's a very, very complicated process. The patient would need usually IV antibiotics. They need uh, uh, surgery oftentimes, wound care, impro improvement of the blood circulation by surgical intervention. And uh, if, it, if this disease is not treated properly with a bunch of uh, experts in the field, oftentimes it can lead into amputations, unfortunately. All right, doctor, thank you. I think this is probably more your question, but I'm going to ask him anyway about this. Um, let's say you're sleeping at night and you're in bed and your, your body just falls. Uh, you're, you're, it's like you get cramps mm -hmm. below the waist. You yes. can't move. Is that something to be very, you know, and all of a sudden you feel like your feet are asleep and, oh, you got the tingling since, and it goes on time and time again. Is that something to... Absolutely. Uh, oftentimes in uh, our uh, uh, diabetes uh, population, this is a, a very common uh, complaint that they may have uh, because the disease may affect the nerves. And typically that happens at night when they're trying to rest. The tingling is usually severe enough where they, uh, they may not be able to rest or uh, uh, fall asleep. So we get this uh, complaint all the time, and that definitely can... Uh, raise questions of, of uncontrolled diabetes. Maybe it's a very early sign of it. Dr. Sheikh, all right, now walk back. Right. Let's, let's time, time him. Put him on the timer then. Uh, the, the 16, yeah. oh, he's quick, he's quicker now. Again, if you have any questions, hit us up on Facebook, hit us up on YouTube here. These doctors are right here for the next hour and they're gonna be answering your questions. A, a common and serious complication is diabetic neuropathy. Dr. Ho is gonna answer about, what is that, diabetic neuropathy? Dr. Sheikh actually touched a little bit about it. Diabetic neuropathy is typically a nerve damage that happens in your feet um, caused by diabetes. The most common side effects people will feel is this numbness feeling in their feet. They lose the sensation of what the floor feels like. Um, other symptoms are pins and needles, tingling, sharp shooting pains. They wake you up in the middle of the night. You gotta shake your foot out before you can go back to sleep. Um, why is it so important to get checked if you do have this is you can step on something or you can develop a wound on the bottom of your foot and not actually feel it. Um, you won't notice it because it doesn't hurt you and then it can be a source for bacteria to jump on board and then cause an infection. Are you saying you, can, you can't feel cold either? You can't feel if you step on a fire, uh, you know, a log? So if a hot summer you go outside barefoot on concrete, you can burn yourself and then not be able to heal it and cause a cycle of Bad things happening. Well, let's bring Dr. Martin in. A patient stubs their toe, steps on a nail, maybe finds a blister is formed in their foot, and it's not going away. What's the first step? Yeah, uh, they need to seek medical care, um, particularly if they have diabetes or peripheral vascular disease or other uh, complex chronic medical conditions. And remember, uh, there's a good number of diabetics that don't know they have diabetes. Uh, so these uh, little wounds can become big problems. And um, what we know is that the best time for that patient to seek care is right away because our chance to have a successful outcome is enhanced by getting early treatment. And we know that by uh, letting time pass that that ulcer can lead to other complications in the feet that can then go ahead and uh, lead to amputation. How long do you let, you know, well, this wound hasn't healed in three days? I mean, how long do uh, you get Diabetics it? should not wait on any wound in their foot uh, because uh, the infection can travel in a day. Uh, so we, we consider them all uh, serious. And, um, you know, for the patient, they, they know they have a wound, but they may not know why they have a wound or what's the underlying cause of that wound. So the, the, the good news for the patient is they don't need to know. They, if they come to our facility, they're going to get 
all the expert care that they need because it's probably not just a wound. It's, there's probably some underlying podiatric problem. Uh, there may very well be uh, vascular disease. We may need to bring in hyperbaric medicine to take this uh, take care of this patient. So it really takes uh, a team to take care of this patient rather than one doctor. No, no one doctor has all the expertise to take care of that patient. Let me ask you, I think we get, get to the basics now. The symptoms of diabetes are? The symptoms of diabetes? Uh, for we, we should get Dr. Shake to, to comment, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Dr. Free Shake, come on. Yeah. Oh, now, 23, 24, 20... Let's get to the basics, the symptoms. We're, we're watching it on Facebook Live right now. Somebody may feel dizzy. Their eyes may be going yellow. I mean, is that... So um, the most common uh, symptom of uh, diabetes typically is um, frequent urination. Okay. So which is a result of elevated blood sugar in the blood and the body is trying to get rid of the extra sugar so people tend to urinate a lot which makes them feel dehydrated Color of the thirsty urine? um not uh, it's usually depends on what you drink okay. but it's uh it's usually just a regular urine color okay so um and then uh they may have uh, excessive thirst may have uh, severe weight loss in the span of a couple of weeks uh, general tiredness uh, fatigue uh, and uh, blurry vision that uh, that definitely can happen within the first couple of weeks due to uh, the sugar coming to the eye lenses and uh, make them uh, bulge out and cause some blurriness in the vision that's usually very reversible in that uh, uh, first few weeks. All right, doctor, thank yeah. you. Let me go over to uh, Dr. Carroll. Um, now that we've had the wound, we've had it assessed, wh where do we go from there, doctor? Yes, there's uh, many approaches to the treatment of an ulceration. Uh, one of the most common, most reliable uh, treatments for a wound is a debridement. Uh, there's several different types of debridement. The one most commonly used is called a sharp debridement or a surgical debridement. This includes the use of a scalpel, uh, scissors, a curette, or any sort of sharp instrument. The goal is to turn a chronic wound into an acute wound. And how we do this is by removing biofilm or buildup of bacteria, removing any dead cells. And if we can, we can achieve a bleeding wound base. And this helps stimulate uh, growth as well as new division of cells. Um, in the, the picture down here, I'm demonstrating um, a, sh a sharp debris. I have a curette in my hand. And I'm actually removing any of the dead cells, any sort of additional bacteria buildup, um, and trying to get uh, a bleeding base. Most of our patients, because they have the neuropathy, this is a painless procedure for them. There's several different types of, of debridements as well. We can use autolytic, which is the body's own enzymes to break down uh, tissue. Enzymatic is the use of creams or, or lotions that are commercially made with uh, enzymes that break down uh, tissue. Um, and then sometimes on certain patients, you can use biologic uh, debriders such as larva or wounds. And uh, what you do with these is you actually put uh, maggots onto a wound and they actually selectively eat away dead tissue. Uh, we also can use uh, various amounts of uh, wound dressings, uh, wet to dries, different types of dressings such as alginates, which are actually seaweed based, which help absorb in, of uh, chronically draining wounds, or hydrocolloid dressings, which actually retain moisture inside the wound, which help promote uh, debridements such as the autolytic debridement. Uh, we can also use uh, HBO or hyperbaric oxygen, which will be talked about later. One of the uh, medical equipment that we use most frequently is something called a negative pressure wound vac, uh, or just the wound vac. And what this apparatus does, it applies a consistent negative pressure to the wound. Um, it works on both a mechanical level as well as a biological level. On the mechanical level, it actually absorbs extra fluid. Um, it actually draws in wound margins to help heal the wound. Um, it also promotes granulation tissue. On a microscopic level, it actually promotes um, cell division or cells to grow. It also uh, promotes angiogenesis or the formation of new blood vessels to the wounds. So these are some of the techniques that we like to use uh, in conjunction with each other for, for treatment of um, these ulcerations. Sounds like no patient's the same. Correct. <sighs> yeah. yeah, each patient it gets their own specific um, treatment plan, either with a surgical debridement mixed with a uh, wound vac, hyperbarics. Um, some of these wounds, unfortunately, can become infected, so you have to use antibiotics, either oral or uh, intravenously, depending on if the infection is a soft tissue infection or just localized to the skin or in the bone or a combination of both. 
Dr. Ho, t tell me about this VersaJet. What's this all about? Uh, it's a tool that we like to use in surgery. Um, it creates kind of water with um, a suction type of device that can decrease the amount of bacteria, bio burden on a wound. It gets into the crevices. Um, uh, as you can see, kind of that jet that goes through it with um, a little vacuum that suctions it out. Um, it's a great utilization of surgical debridement to clean up a wound. Um, it makes a nice flat wound bed that you can see in preparation for wound closure or a graft to cover over the wound. If we're at home, we have a wound. Is there anything we can do at home real quick before we even get here? Uh, take a look at it. Uh, if there is pus draining out of it, if there's redness, if it does not smell good, you should probably have someone see that soon. Okay, thank you, doctor, I think. <laughs> All right, HBO, and we're not talking about HBO that we buy. Uh, Dr. Blakakis, Blazakis is here. Uh, explain to me what the HBO therapy is. Sure, so HBO stands for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and it's a therapy that involves uh, a high pressure of oxygen within a, an acrylic chamber. So at Good Sam, we have what's called a monoplace chamber, meaning one patient per chamber. And then the nurse and the physician are uh, treating that patient while they're inside the chamber. So here's a visual of what a hyperbaric chamber looks like. And uh, the patient is undergoing their treatment right now. How long has this been around? Uh, <clears throat> a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, the, the indications for hyperbaric. So there's primary indications for hyperbaric and then there's secondary. So the primary... Uh, inner, uh, indications are things like arterial air embolism or um, decompression sickness from doing like a scuba dive and getting really? nitrogen bubbles. And then what we use it for mostly is for uh, diseases that are more related to hypoxic tissue. So wound care, uh, wo uh, chronic wounds, flaps and grafts that are compromised, uh, chronic osteomyelitis or infection in the bone. And we also use it for like radiation uh, tissues that have gone undergone radiation that won't heal. So those are the indications. Um, we have um, lots of patients that come in for wound care. And the way that the hyperbaric works is when you're in the chamber and it's pressurized, you're now able to carry oxygen to the tissues through your hemoglobin, which is how we all do it normally, and also the oxygen gets driven into the plasma, so it's dissolving into the plasma and going to the area, the target area now. So you're getting up to 200% more oxygen to that area that was hypoxic in the past. So that's the mechanism of action of the hyperbaric. Okay, HBO, there you go. All right, Dr. Brown, what is peripheral ar arterial disease and how does this all relate to chronic diabetes and chronic wounds? Absolutely. So, uh, as Elena just alluded to, if you don't have enough oxygen getting to these tissues, they won't heal. And peripheral arterial disease um, basically is blockages in the arteries that don't allow good blood flow, that hemoglobin that Elena talked about, to get to these wounds to heal them. Um, peripheral arterial disease comes on a, a whole spectrum of severity, uh, depending on how much uh, plaque and blockages in the arteries there are and where in the arteries they are. Um, just like any um, artery, uh, the arteries in the legs um, supply blood to the distal portions of the leg and without that good blood flow you can't get the oxygen. Without the oxygen you can't get, uh, you can't get wound healing. Um, as I said, severity, the symptoms of peripheral arterial disease um, aren't always wounds. They can range from just pain when we walk. Uh, that's called something called claudication. Um, it all comes from a supply and demand mismatch. So when you exercise, you're not getting enough of that oxygen due to these blockages in the arteries, and that causes pain in the legs. <clears throat> it's the same physiology as when you used to run wind sprints when you were a kid and you get the side stitch. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same physiology. You're, not just, you're just not getting enough blood flow to that muscle and that causes pain. As it gets worse, um, you don't necessarily develop wounds um, with peripheral arterial disease, but if you get a wound, 
secondary to everything we've been talking about, stepping on a nail, burning your foot with diabetic neuropathy and so forth. You may have a wound that can get infected and so forth, and you may have enough blood flow to keep wounds from developing, but you don't have enough blood flow to heal the wounds that were brought on by the diabetes. Um, we diagnose peripheral arterial disease, generally speaking, with non-invasive methods. Um, if one of uh, my colleagues comes in and says, hey, I got a guy, I'm not sure if he's got enough blood flow to heal this wound, we bring in, we do different blood pressure measurements on your ankles um, and, and different parts of your leg to see how good the blood flow is in that portion of the leg. We will also do ultrasounds to actually look at the specific arteries see where the blockages are, see how amenable they are to different treatments. Now, in, for, in terms of treatment, uh, it's also relatively non-invasive. Um, there are several different modalities of treatment, um, both open surgical methods and endovascular. And by endovascular, I mean wires, stents, balloons, things like that. Um, so generally speaking, we would get access to an artery um, with a wire or a catheter. Uh, if we find a blockage, we can, we can blow up a balloon, open that artery up. If the uh, blockage is not uh, responsive to the balloon, we can also do things uh, like atherectomy, uh, as you see, where basically we have these different devices that break up the blockages in the artery, and then we can come back and do uh, once we've gotten through the blockage, blow it up with a balloon or place a stent, as, as you're going to see here. Um, once that's all said and done, um, you know, we can then assure that you have enough blood flow uh, to those distal portions to, to heal these wounds. Unfortunately, not all blockages are amenable to these kinds of treatments with wires and stents and so forth, as you might imagine. And in that case, sometimes we have to go and do a bypass where we'll either take your own vein or a piece of plastic vein and basically bypass around these blockages if they're too severe. So there's a broad range of treatments and, and uh, modalities that we can really assure that we're going to get enough blood flow, get enough oxygen to those tissues to heal these wounds. He just got out of med school about five minutes ago. That is, <laughs> wow, you are something. Let me ask you this, seriously. How many people are walking around with this, this going on inside their body, and they don't know it. Well, that's, that's actually a really good point. I think there is a, a large portion of the population, I'm not sure uh, exact percentages, sure, I don't sure. think anyone does, yes. but I would say that um, a lot of people walk around and they say, oh, well, I'm getting a little older, I'm a little overweight, my legs hurt, and they ignore it, and this could absolutely be uh, peripheral arterial disease kind of lying in the shadows waiting to... Uh, to cause major problems. All right, let's go to our question from our, is this coming from YouTube? All right, here's the question. I get a deep, dry crack on my foot. What kind of cream should I use? My MedStar is in beautiful downtown Bel Air. All right, who wants to field that question? What kind of cream should they use? Well, well I'll start. Okay. Uh, and then I'll have my uh, podiatrist colleagues back me up. But <laughs> We, we get really uncomfortable giving okay. broad-based advice because we know, uh, I don't know anything about this, uh, this person calling in, right. but, but we know that even that crack could be really serious, and uh, particularly if there's a history of diabetes. So I, I think to the extent that there's a, a, a question about moisturizing an unwounded uh, foot, I think my colleagues can speak to that, but, but it'll be hard for us to want to speak Generically, these, these treatments that we give the patient are always uh, tailored because they're always uh, serious. Okay, so you don't have to run down to uh, the local pharmacy right now. Yeah, you didn't, you didn't tell me how to fill my crack. All right, listen, if I had a family member or a friend with a wound, how would he or she know if HBO treatment is appropriate? Sure, you can feel that one. It's a great question, and we have people come in all the time for a detailed consult, and we talk to the patients about what their wound, where their wound is, the etiology of the wound, or what caused the wound, or what is the underlying factor that the wound will not heal, and then we determine whether the wound is, or the patient is a candidate based on what they have to undergo hyperbaric. And there actually are fairly strict criteria for placing a patient into hyperbaric 
therapy, and it is one, only one treatment uh, for the wound. So there's many treatments that we should be doing for a wound, and hyperbaric is just one of them. So if we're uh, engaging that patient with uh, the multi multidisciplinary team and we've got everything in line and their wound will not heal, then we would place them in hyperbaric. All right, here's another Facebook. What is the best treatment for neuropathy? What's the best treatment? treatments uh, for neuropathy um, in the early stages. I don't know if Dr. Uh, do, do I keep putting you on the spot, but uh, really the medical management is, is, the, is the primary route, and you may want to speak to that. There are some surgical techniques, but after, after medical management fails. So um, the best treatment for diabetes from neuropathy is treating diabetes properly and making the sugars under control because we know that may help with reverse the acuity of the symptoms and the taking the edge out of the uh, numbness or tingling or maybe the pain. We have some therapies that have response to, uh, some people respond to them and some people don't. There are some creams out there, there are some pills that we usually try, but the bottom line is make sure that your sugar is under control, make sure that your feet have no ulcers that can cause any of these things that we're talking about today. Okay, we're taking a look at that. What are we looking at right now? This is an insulin pump. There you go. And There's this small pump. pod has insulin that gets hooked to a, uh, a uh, wireless machine that they can, the patients who have diabetes can uh, program it so the pump is uh, uh, giving them the amount of insulin that uh, the doctors uh, prescribe. All right, Dr. Sheikh, thank sure. you. Just stand right here, okay? Don't, don't go. <laughs> I want you right here, beck and call. You're on call right here. Let me just ask you here, I know what the audience is thinking. I've got a wound at home. I love it on North Calvert. I love this place. It's a beautiful hospital, but I don't want to come here for what looks like a long-term I mean, how long are we looking at from coming in, getting checked out? Are you going to be able to? Are you going to be able to go home? That kind of stuff. I think everybody's concerned about the long term. How long is this going to take to, to the wound to heal, doctor? So, uh, the first of all, we don't want them to stay away because they're worried about it take long because uh, it's it's that delay and that happens. So I'm glad you're bringing it up. Is is people are putting it off because, because they don't want to and they've heard it. stories about what happens when you have a wound and you have diabetes. Um, but the, the most important point to drive home to everybody is that now's the time. And the sooner we get on it, that the shorter that treatment course is going to be. In terms of predicting healing time for a patient, which I think it was, was uh, at the root of your question, you know, we can say that for most of the complex wounds that come into our center, 85% of them are going to be healed by three months. Mm. But if you ask me on any one particular patient, we're really not very good at predicting right, that. Right. Okay, doctor. All right, Dr. Carroll, we heard that Dr. Martin mentioned Charcot foot, right? Can you tell us more about that? Yes. So Charcot neuroarthropathy can affect about 5 to 10% of the diabetic population. Uh, this condition is characterized by weakening of the bones the, in the joints as well as the soft tissue of the foot and ankle, but it can affect other joints. If this condition is left unprotected and the patient continues to walk, the um, structural integrity of the foot can be compromised and this can lead to collapse of the arch. This can make it impossible or very difficult for patients to walk. Um, subsequently, patients can develop ulcerations, infections, and they can actually lead to amputations. Um, a characteristic of the arch collapse is seen in this photo up here of what they call the rocker bottom foot. In a patient with Charcot who continues to ambulate on a weakened uh, foot, the bones of the midfoot can collapse, causing a pressure point, as you can kind of see as an apex, almost down like a triangle at the bottom part of the foot. That can lead to ulceration formation, uh, infection, a uh, condition called osteomyelitis, which is a bone infection, and subsequently uh, can lead to amputation. So what we do for our patients who are undergoing um, either a Charcot condition is we, have, we can use a conservative treatments, which includes bracing as well as protective boots. Uh, on the pictures up here in the center here, this is called a crow boot or a Charcot restraint orthotic walker. As you can see, it's a custom-made boot. It looks like a Terminator boot by the size. It actually goes up close to the knee. It's actually got a plastic shell with a very soft, custom-molded 
a soft material in the inside which is custom molded to uh, that specific person's foot. Um, it's closed and tight fit to provide stability when the patient is walking. In some patients, a boot alone may not be enough to treat the Charcot and they may continue to ulcerate or the deformity is so severe that it may lead to instability. Um, and that route, we kind of look at this uh, pathology and may take a surgical approach. Uh, there's, there's two types of surgical approaches we can apply um, with this. One of them is a procedure called a simple exostectomy, which is actually just shaving off a bump. If you see on this picture here, um, down at the bottom of the screen, the, the foot, the front part of the foot on the left-hand side is elevated, and you can almost see like a spike down at the middle there. In a patient who has a solid, fused, or very stable foot, shaving off that bump can actually alleviate the pressure. Um, and that actually can be one of the quickest ways to get the patients back onto their feet or back into the shoes. Uh, unfortunately, when a deformity is unstable, the bones keep moving, there's multiple areas of pressure, uh, regardless if we've done exostectomies or shaving down the bumps, bracing or boots, they may need a reconstruction. And what that means is a patient may undergo a procedure called an osteotomy or a fusion of a joint, which is a uh, osteotomy is a large bone cut uh, through a bone. Um, and for these particular patients, it's actually removing out a, a substantial amount of bone to kind of shorten the foot and take away any pressure points. Uh, these are fixated with either plates or screws or external fixation or a giant cage to help protect the bone while it's, it's healing. Um, and other times, we actually can fuse direct joints around the affected area, and this will actually add as protection to uh, the area of, of concern. All right, thank you. We have a question here from our Facebook watchers. Uh, besides having diabetes, are there any other pre-existing conditions that could prevent my loved one's wound from healing? All right, someone uh, want to so, buzz in? I, I was hoping I could get you to talk about venous insufficiency. Uh, yeah, that's actually a really yeah. good point. Um, <clears throat> so just like arteries, veins carry blood. However, that's about where the similarities end. Um, arteries take blood from your heart out to your extremities and to your organs. Veins bring it all back. Veins, however, have a very different structure. Um, and veins have these little one-way valves that keep blood flowing against gravity back to your heart. And oftentimes, what we see is these little valves in the veins stop working over time. And this can be manifested um, by a lot of different things. Um, probably the most people are familiar with is varicose veins. Mm -hmm. And it can be very benign, annoying, unsightly, spider veins, things like that. But it can get severe enough where you have um, basically high pressures in these veins due to blood kind of pooling in the, in the extremities, and it can result in ulceration. So not only is it important to get good oxygenated blood to your extremities through the arteries, but you really need to get that blood that's deoxygenated out of the extremities so that good oxygenated blood can get in. And oftentimes that can result in swelling, uh, chronic edema, um, and swelling that can then lead to skin breakdown. And there's different surgical procedures that we can do uh, from the vascular side of things to alleviate um, some of these vein problems and help these wounds to heal. They're very rare, admittedly, um, and thankfully, uh, it's very rare for venous disease to get to that point. Um, but when it does happen, uh, it's important to get in and get it evaluated um, so that we can uh, intervene and hopefully get those wounds to heal. All right, we're going to stay right with you because I think we scratched the surface at the top here, but here we are 30, 35 minutes into this tonight. Uh, Pay attention to lingering cuts, scratches, sores on your toes, feet, legs. Control your diabetes and be mindful of symptoms of PAD. Tell me right. about that. So, again, the peripheral arterial disease, depending on its severity, can manifest itself in a lot of different ways. It can completely be asymptomatic where you don't even know you have it. I'd say most people are that way that do have peripheral arterial disease. Um, it can manifest itself, uh, again, as claudication, where you have pain when you walk. Um, and it's very typically, like I said, it's a supply and demand problem. So it's a very reproducible pain. Um, a lot of people say, oh, my knee hurts or my hips hurt. 
my back hurts, but this is a very reproducible pain. You walk a certain distance. It hurts generally in the larger muscle groups in your legs. Every day. Every day, every time you walk. It's a very, very reproducible thing. So people who typically have true claudication will say, I can walk however many feet. I can walk 20 feet, I can walk 50 feet, whatever it is, yeah. and I get severe pain in the larger muscle groups, generally the calves, because they're further from the, the heart. I stop, that supply and demand mismatch goes away, because you stopped exercising, the oxygen balance gets better, the pain goes away, and you can walk exactly 50 feet again. Um, and so that's kind of where it starts, and that's where those symptoms start. But symptoms, as you get further along, um, can be much more severe. In other words, you can get that claudication even at five, six feet, and these people are severely debilitated and they can't function, they can't walk, uh, they can't enjoy their lives. Um, and ultimately that can lead to um, deconditioning, heart disease, and so forth. <clears throat> In addition, you can get to a point where you have essentially what we call rest pain. In other words, that supply and demand mismatch never goes away. You never have enough oxygen to really support your tissues. And that manifests itself as pain similar to diabetic neuropathy at night, mm -hmm. but it's generally an ache, a real dull ache, generally in the foot uh, or in the toes. Um, and strangely enough, it often gets better when the patient stands up or hangs their foot off the side of the table or the bed in this instance, um, because that little extra pull of gravity gets enough blood flow to those tissues to reduce the pain. And it's extremely important that gets into um, when you start having rest pain and so forth. That's when wounds really start to become a problem and amputation rates skyrocket. All right, let's go to Dr. Ho on that. The goal of treatment is to prevent amputation. I mean, that's the last resort here and uh, preserve the limb function. What are the considerations you have to make as a surgeon when a patient has a foot wound that has become a limb threatening infection, Dr. Ho? Um, yeah, um, when they come in, a lot of times the first thing we think about is actually controlling their infection. Um, by controlling their infection, you're actually making them feel better. They aren't feeling as sick. Um, they don't have as many fevers. Um, and then after multiple surgeries, um, we have to think about how we can give them a functional foot without losing their limb. Um, a lot of times patients will be fearful of the word amputation. Um, they've lost one toe already, and this infection brought them to losing a second toe. Um, and they don't want to hear that they're about to lose all their toes, but that might actually be the most functional outcome where they have a foot that they can walk on without a wound, uh, without something that's going to cause them to come back with another infection. Um, so someone who's lost one or two toes, like in this x-ray, um, you have to think about, you know, is this foot actually functional? Can they actually walk on this when you close their wound? Um, the problem is their toes start to dislocate. Um, they can potentially get fractures. Um, like on the next slide, um, if you were actually to complete their amputation, um, remove all of their toes, they actually have restored what's called a normal parabola. Um, this is a midfoot amputation called a transmetatarsal amputation. It's something that's very functional. Patients will be fearful because the word amputation, they've lost half their foot. But this is something that allows them to wear a shoe that has a toe filler. Um, they can walk, they can go back to their normal lives, and people wouldn't be able to see it when they're wearing shoes. Um, it's not without complications. Mm -hmm. So in the next slide, um, because you've lost half their foot, they can develop what's called an Aquinas contracture where the Achilles is pulling their foot down. Um, their foot is no longer at a 90 degree angle to their um, leg, so they can get a repeat ulcer at the end of their amputation stump. So we do a simple procedure, like on the next slide, where we have three small incisions in the back, lengthen their Achilles so they can actually stand straight and continue walking and going about. Um, it's important that they still keep coming back um, to make sure they get their foot checked because the other rotational plane problem that happens, um, like in the next slide, um, and this is somebody who has restored their normal 90 degrees. Um, the next slide shows the foot kind of rotated um, where the front part of their foot starts to pull up higher and the outside part of their foot turns down. Um, you can get rubbing on the inside of the shoe, so they get ulcers on one side, or if the other side is uh, lower down, they get a wound on the bottom. So you can easily do other things to balance this foot out, like in the next one. 
um, so that they're nice and perpendicular. And this way, their foot stays flat uh, 90 degrees to their leg. They have their shoe that they can use and not have any problems that they come back with. All right, well, listen, we're about 20 minutes away from wrapping this up, but if you have a question, go to YouTube, you're on it right now, and also go to Facebook Live, you're on it right now. Fire off a question. I know you're home. You may be suffering. This is your chance to ask a question. I'm going to ask Dr. Shake again. Diabetes, to fight it off, what should we be doing right now? So the most important thing is to know that you have the disease. So screening is super important because like a peripheral vascular disease, uh, many people would be walking down the streets without knowing that they have diabetes. So uh, screening is very important, especially if you have uh, risk factors for diabetes. If you're overweight, if you have somebody in your family uh, who has type 2 diabetes, that increases your risk of having it. So uh, that's an easy blood test uh, that most of the doctors are going to do it. Then the second thing is going to be lifestyle. And I cannot uh, emphasize the importance of uh, exercise, weight loss, uh, following a well-balanced diet. Uh, I usually tell my patients to have a dinner plate that half of it is vegetables, a quarter a starch, and a quarter a protein. And that, by just trying to diversify the diet and not uh, eating too much processed food, uh, food that is high in starch or fat, that can definitely decrease the chances of weight gain and then also uh, decrease the chances of them encountering this nasty disease. On Facebook, we have a question. How do I refer a patient for hyperbaric therapy? How do I do that? I had another question about hyperbaric therapy uh, earlier, and it is very challenging for uh, referring providers and for uh, patients at home to really know, am I truly a candidate for hyperbaric therapy? It's a very complicated analysis that we have to do to uh, make sure that we're offering them the right uh, treatment. So uh, the thing to do is to, is to call our center and uh, we can get you in quickly, and um, we, you really won't be just seen for hyperbaric therapy because we really have to look at uh, the whole picture and figure out how hyperbarics might fit into your care plan. And from YouTube, can I use a foot soak if I am a diabetic? This can be a tough question to answer, just based on you know, the stages of diabetes you have, if you have neuropathy, any open wounds, what you plan to soak the foot in, if it's just warm water and salt, or if it's soap, or if it's hot water. So it, it depends. I, my recommendation is to check with your uh, Medicare, excuse me, your medical doctor ahead of time to determine if what solutions or what compounds you want to put on your foot is appropriate. Uh, my grandmother's no longer here, but I think that came from her. I mean, <laughs> that, that, they all did, oh, we'll just put it, we'll soak it in water. I want to go down the line. We'll start with you, doctor. Um, I want you to tell me your greatest success story, one of those stories about a patient that keeps you going and walking the halls and making sure people are taken care of. What, what is that one story that sticks out that will always live with you? That's a great question. I actually had a patient that came over from the eastern shore. He had um, peripheral vascular disease, previous uh, partial fifth ray amputation, so he lost his fifth toe as well as part of the metatarsal behind it. Uh, had seen several podiatrists, several other vascular surgeons and said, you need a below knee amputation. He came all the way to our Good Samaritan um, facility and he said, you got to save my foot. Um, so through the use of, we, we threw out all the, the, ki the kitchen sink at him. We um, Surgical debridements, hyperbarics on several occasions, wound vac, um, skin grafts, even some local tissue flaps of just rotating the skin around. And, we actually were able to save this person's foot, and he is so grateful. He still comes to me, um, and that's probably one of the most greatest success stories I've had that's since great. I've been in practice. So it's, it's um, we used every single technique that we've discussed up here to save this guy's foot, and he's so happy that he's out walking on a foot. Um, so happy that he's he ran into you. <laughs> there you go, Doctor Ho. That one question that keeps you in your white coat. Yeah, the the multiple patients who. Um, they come in with an infection. They may not have known they had diabetes. Their sugars are out of control. Um, and they have a horrible infection that is about to not only take their limb, but could potentially take their life. Um, and you come in with your team of everybody um, who helps them. You save their limb. 
Um, and when I see them for that final follow-up where they're back in their shoes, they're actually walking, and they see me and they say hi to me, is when, what's really rewarding that keeps me there. That's great. Dr. Martin, yeah. tell, me, tell me that story of telling that person that's sitting right across from you the worst and then seeing the best. Yeah, I mean, these are the stories that, that keep us going, and I hope, I hope uh, our enthusiasm for this work uh, can come across in this, yeah, in this forum. But, um, but yeah, uh, this is a roller coaster ride. They, the patients come in, and um, we say they have a limb-threatening infection. That's what they come in with. And uh, this team uh, basically is, is called into action because the, the case that Tiffany was describing earlier about the patient that comes in with a bad infection, all these things we're doing are happening almost uh, simultaneously. So we're, we're having uh, surgery to control the infection. We're having Dr. Brown come in and restore the circulation. The plastic surgeons and podiatric surgeons are conferring about how do we get the best structure around this foot so that this person can walk. And often we're getting hyperbarics involved too to try and get our best outcome. So we have to start with a very frank conversation with that patient because the reality is when they come in we don't we don't know yet where we're going with this so uh, and we have to be direct with the patient because our credibility is going to be so important going forward because we need a uh, lasting relationship with this patient because it's it's multiple surgeries and once we get past the crisis point we need to keep them on task because there's other things they need to do in terms of the rehabilitation so uh, in some ways, it's that, it's that roller coaster uh, that can be so exciting for us because we feel the depths when the patient is upset about the information we're giving you, and, then, and we're sharing these patients. So when we have a success, we're sharing that together. Uh, there was a video there of, um, of a, an event that happens every evening where we're rounding um, that was, they were just showing, um, but it's... it's working together, solving these life-changing problems for patients that really keeps us going. All right, doctor, what keeps you going? And also, I'm going to tack on, why this field? Why in medicine? Why did you, what was it that drew you into this? Wound care? Yeah. What drew you into this? <laughs> well, I think that, you know, what everyone else has already touched on is that you have such a serious, you know, initial visit and then you see the outcomes and you see people getting back to functioning. And the fact that there's so many um, components to the multidisciplinary team, there's so many people involved and it's a great team to work with. And so I just, I love that there's so many components and so many professionals working to make that person get back onto their feet. Let me ask you this, you're stumped at home, you come in, all of a sudden you get it. What's that feeling like? All of a sudden, <laughs> hey, let's try this. Let's see I, oh works. yeah, I will. I will be at home, and I will be thinking about a patient, and you know what we can do to help them to heal. And, and then I'm excited the next time that they come in to try something new. And you know, a lot of times it, it works. It and works. It's a great feeling. All right, doctor. All right, come on. We'll get the. the <laughs> tell me that one story. Um, always lives with you. I I think uh, one of our. Group greatest success stories was a gentleman um, that I got to participate. I don't get to participate in every single one of these patients' care um, because they don't have all have blood. They don't all oh, have okay. bad blood flow. I thought they would keep me out. I know. I wish. <laughs> um, no, but um, we had a gentleman who who came from another hospital, um, and they, he was told that he would need bilateral above knee amputations, and they had him on the schedule to do so, mm. and uh, he said no way. I hear there's a limb salvage program at Good Samaritan. I want to go check it out. I want a second opinion. And he came over. I think I, I, I hope you guys remember him. Mm -hmm. um, he had significant wounds. Um, he had knee contractures because he'd been in a wheelchair for a long time. But, you know, it's all about risk to benefit ratio. And, yes, we're probably not going to do these massive bypass surgeries on, on somebody in a wheelchair, but at the same time, if there's something we can do to improve his blood flow, to heal his wounds, you know, there's no reason he needs to have a bilateral amputation. And, uh, and sure enough, I did um, the stents and the angiograms and so forth on both of his legs, um, and uh, I, I think he needed some minor amputations, but he kept both his legs.
He was which right was to pretty, come. Which he is pretty was right. amazing. I want that second opinion. We have a question <laughs> on Facebook. I've heard about a wound vac. What does it do? Yes, yeah, so the wound vac or the negative pressure wound vac is a device that uh, provides constant negative pressure, or sometimes it could be uh, constant pressure. I think we have a picture up here, and what this does is it works on two levels. It works on the biological level as well as the microscopic level. On the biological level, the, uh, the macroscopic level, what this does is it actually sucks out any fluid, any sort of material that could uh, potentially be infectious. Um, it also kind of draws in our wound edges, so we're trying to slowly close the wound in over time, as well as promote tissue called granulation tissue, which is essential for wound healing. On a more of a microscopic level, it actually promotes cells to divide or grow. It also promotes uh, the formation of new blood cells, which allow more cells to come <coughs> to the wound to promote wound healing. Um, it also allows um, for us to kind of irrigate or clean out the wound in a specialty uh, device called a um, vac veriflow, which actually uses uh, saline, can be infused into irrigated wound to clean it out, and it later gets sucked, sucked out through the, um, the vac sponges you can kind of see on this uh, particular image here. So there's many different functions of the wound vac, and we use it for multiple different applications, such as if we want to put on grafts, we use it over grafts. Split thickness skin grafts, it works great for us. Synthetic grafts. Um, you can be used over tendon, you can use over bone. So there's many versatility to this uh, device. All right, listen, we're still open. You can get us on Facebook Live and YouTube. Fire off a question here. If you're watching us, please fire off because these are the experts here. This is a great question here. This is almost like a wrap-up. When should I call you if I have a problem? We, we said that at the top right away, <laughs> yeah. right now. Earlier the better. I'll tell you... Um, uh, we, you know, you, you worry maybe you raise the alarm and, you, and then all of a sudden you get a bunch of people coming in that don't really have problems. It just doesn't happen. I mean, we, our center's been around for uh, close to 20 years uh, doing wound care, and it's, it's quite uncommon for a patient to come in that they were, they were just being a little overreactive. I mean, for the most part, patients are really good about Knowing, knowing when to come in, and we rarely see somebody where we're like, oh, no, you're going to be fine. You, know, you don't need our help. I mean, you, most people we can, we can bring value to. All right. Can I shower? Can you shower? I, I, you know <laughs> what? I can answer that question. I'm not even a doctor. I can answer that. We, we you general, get... Yeah. So uh, there, are, there are certain circumstances where we discourage it immediately after surgery. Uh, but generally, uh, showering is, is okay. okay. It's... Uh, it's usually many patients are told the opposite of that. Um, people are told to keep their wounds uh, their uh, wounds dry, but we generally like to have the wounds cleansed. And so the challenge really for showering is: uh, can they stay off their wound when they're doing it? Can they use good technique? But for the most part, uh, we we approve of uh, cleansing the wounds in the shower. Right. Here's another Facebook question: What items are allowed inside of the HBO chamber? be easier to explain what is not allowed inside of the <laughs> HBO <laughs> chamber. Um, no synthetic material, you know, um, no cell phones, nothing that would cause a fire, no um, electronic devices, no paper. Uh, lot, most wound dressings are okay, so when the patient comes in and they have a dressing on their wound, then that's fine. That, that can go in the chamber. We ask the patients when they come in to change out of their street clothes and put on uh, scrubs that we give them that are made of cotton. Um, we allow the patient to have a drink in there, which is in a plastic container. Um, yeah. Can I exercise? Well, it depends on the pain and severity, right? So, exercise, so uh, with limb salvage, uh, the whole purpose is to keep people moving. So when people stop moving, uh, they can suffer other medical conditions. So, so it's an equivocal answer because most of our immediate attention is to taking pressure off of wounds. Uh, so if it's on a foot, uh, it may be difficult to exercise. We have uh, one of the best rehab centers uh, in the state, and one of the nice things is we can get our patients in there that maybe are not allowed to put pressure on their foot but they can get them exercising in other ways and mobile in other ways because it's really important to keep moving while still protecting the, all the work that we're doing. I think everybody that's watched us tonight on Facebook Live and YouTube feels there's a team effort here. And Dr. Ho, just talk about the team that we have assembled here. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's it. These complex are uh, these patients are so complex. Um, their wounds are complex. They are sick patients who have a lot of other things. Um, one physician cannot handle this on their own. Um, you require a multidisciplinary team, um, doctors from various specialties, podiatric, plastics, vascular, endocrine. Um, you require PAs and NPs to help you. Um, and Good Samaritan is building this beautiful team to help you get back on your feet. Doctor? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, teamwork is everything. We see it in lots of aspects of medicine. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason for that is the benefits have been so good for the patients. If, uh, you know, last uh, century, a code team was invented in hospitals because they realized that when people were having a crisis in a hospital, uh, the nurse wasn't able to wait till a doctor was available. They had to call a code blue team. And this was a team of health professionals, all with different skill sets, all tasked with descending on that patient at a moment's notice so that that patient had all the benefits of all their skills so that they could get treated and have the best possible outcome. And that's, that's essentially what we're doing. You show up at our facility and we're trying to bring all these forces to bear at once because we know that that's our best chance for a successful outcome. Look at this on, on Facebook right now. You've inspired somebody in med school. This is great. Thank you for the inspiring work you all do. Do you perform surgery on structural abnormalities, bunions, oh, hammer toes, uh, to prevent ulcers in high-risk patients? Can this cause more harm than good? medical that's student. Whoa. Yeah. That's... Um, and I'm so happy we're inspiring you. Um, in a high-risk patient, you worry that they have to come back in. Um, you have to look at the patient as a whole. Are they medically optimized? How are their blood sugars? What is their vascular status before you actually make that decision? So um, study hard um, <laughs> and hopefully you'll, you'll understand when, you, when you're standing in front of that patient. Well, you'll be up here on this day uh, pretty soon. That's great. All right, I want to bring up Brad Chambers, who is the president of MedStar Good Samaritan and MedStar Union Memorial Hospital. He is the president. Oh, you're Jamie, right here. Thank you. I'm right you? here. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, on behalf of everyone uh, across MedStar Health, uh, in particular, our wonderful family and colleagues at MedStar Good Samaritan Hospital, I want to thank all of you for joining in tonight. A special thanks to Jamie and our media partner, WMAR. They've been on this journey with us for many years, supporting our webcast series. But more importantly, congratulations and a thank you to this wonderful panel of people. Dr. Shake, you know, you've been always <laughs> off running back and forth here. Uh, thank you. Um, we're very proud of our wound and limb saving program at Good Samaritan. Tonight was really just a, a flavor of um, the wonderful things that we're doing. Please reach out to us. The number is provided uh, here on the screen. And we really, on behalf of MedStar Health, thank you for tuning in tonight and supporting Good Samaritan Hospital and the Wound Care Program. Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you, Jerry. Appreciate it. Thank always. you so much. Hey, listen, I think we cured you tonight, didn't we? And I know you may be shy to get on Facebook Live or YouTube, but here's the number to call, 443-444-4275. Doctors, you were wonderful. Thank you for your time, your expertise, and for saving our limbs and making sure our wounds are healed. Thank you for joining us here tonight from MedStar Union Memorial Hospital. Great job.